Hello and welcome to Even the Trunchful, our show about children's books and why we still love them as adults. She's Nina. They're Matt. And we think that children's books are for everyone because we've all been kids. Even, Even the, the Trunchful. Trunchful. They're all mistakes, children. Filthy, nasty things. Glad I never was one. From Roald Dahl's beloved Matilda, despite her protestations. Each episode, we review one picture book and one chapter book. We have started off with the books that we read as kids, but if you've got a book that you'd like us to review, especially if you are currently a kid, please get in touch. You can email us at eventhetrunchable at gmail.com or catch us on Twitter at trunchfulpod. You can also now catch us on Facebook, also at trunchfulpod. We've got a Facebook page just in time for season three. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> This week, we're reading books that deal with peace and war. I want to note at the top here that we're aware that both of our books are from white British men's perspectives of the First and Second World Wars. So we've gone in on one very specific set of experiences rather than trying to span the range. We know this is only a very small slice of humanity's experience of wars. Our picture book is The General by Janet Charters and illustrated by Michael Foreman. And that's from 1961, that book. And our chapter book is Private Peaceful by Michael Mulpergo, um, which is an absolute favourite, something Nina and I both read as kids. Uh, separately, of course. We didn't know each other back then. That's been very formative for both of us. Um, so we're going to start with that one. Um, as a blanket content note, as you might expect from a book dealing with World War One, there's death, destruction, bombs. We won't be describing the more graphic moments here, but if you're going to read it yourself, and we really, really do recommend that you do, just be aware of that. So, Private Peaceful. Our narrator starts out sort of telling us his whole life. It's first-person narration from Tomo Peaceful who is a boy who lives in the groundskeeper's cottage with his mum and his two brothers, and at the beginning, his dad too. And he's just, he seems to be sitting up all night, and he's telling us his life story and the life story of his family. They live on this cottage on the grounds of the colonel, some, like, well-to-do bloke that they live near, um, and his dad's the groundskeeper, but when Tom was quite young, his dad has an accident at work, basically, and is killed. And in order to keep the cottage, his mum has to go into service at the big house. And the grandmother has to come in to look after his big brother, Big Joe, while he and Charlie are at school. Because Big Joe is a disabled person. He had meningitis when he was a baby, which led to brain damage and so he doesn't go to school and there doesn't seem to be somewhere else for him to go. So yeah, it's just like charts their childhood in that situation, they go poaching, they're friends with this girl Molly, eventually big brother Charlie starts dating Molly and Tomo feels left out and then just as they're both sort of reaching adulthood and they've gone into work at a farm to make some money, World War One breaks out and the colonel insists that in order to keep the cottage, Charlie Peaceful, who is of age, has to go and help with the war effort, has to go and enlist. He's not got a choice. Tomo decides to go with him, to look after him and to not feel left out and to prove to himself that he's not a coward. And then it's the story of their experience during trench warfare. And I think we're going to stop there. I'll say right at the top, I think this is the third or maybe fourth time that I've reread this book. Um, and it messes yeah. me up every time. It's <laughs> just just floods of tears. It's it's so so well written and captures the like the sort of senselessness of war. Yes, yeah. Um, so so well. We start with um, with Tommy going off to school for the first time. His older brother Charlie sticks up for him and gets uh, gets the cane. Um, and it's sort of this description of um, there being not a peep out of Charlie. You know, the other boy who's getting cane that was in this fight is, uh, 
yelping Yelling. every time sorry yeah. sir sorry sir and not a word from charlie and yeah. he comes out so kind of stony faced and smiling and proud yeah which is kind of charlie in a in a nutshell really isn't it yeah i mean this is another masculinity book definitely another really heteronormative book about boys um and I would say a less healthy representation of masculinity as well than in our last book, than in The Last Last Day of Summer. Like, Charlie is your, like, emblem of masculinity. He never cries. He never complains. He's tough. He's good at fighting. Everybody likes him. All the girls fancy him. He's a protector. He goes out to work. Certainly this time reading it through, probably that I'd not had on previous readings when I was younger is like how complicated it must be to have Charlie as a brother because we see Charlie as the big brother through Tomo's eyes and in many ways he is just the best big brother he's always looking out for Tomo Um, everyone else likes him and I think there's a lovely bit when they're like they've joined the war and they're in the training camp and he says um, it would have been easy for me to live in Charlie's shadow but I didn't I lived in his glow and that is, you know, that's yeah. Charlie. That's where he positions himself. He's like, oh, I seem to be shedding yeah. a lot of light here. Here, look, I'll stand behind you. You have some of that. Yeah. He's an absolute gem. But the flip side of that is him and Molly are both so aware that Tomo is completely in love with Molly the whole time they're growing up. And Charlie's approach, yeah, without quite saying so, which is sort of part of the problem is well, look, I'm older than you and she likes me too. And so that's what's happening. It's such a betrayal, isn't it? When he realises they've been seeing each other without him. Yeah, it's when, when it when it turns out that they're seeing each other and, like, Molly's parents are like, oh, you can't, and, like, Charlie and Tomo are just lying in bed together and Tomo's really angry he's not talking. And Charlie sort of says, yeah. like, you love her, don't you? And he doesn't say anything. And he says, right, well, I do too, so you'll understand that I'm going to keep seeing her. Like, he's a, he's, he's a big brother in both senses. You know, there's that line at which, like, I'm going to look after you and you're, like, the most important person in my life. I'm going to put my life before yours. But there is this point, like, there are these lines, there are these points where it's like, you know, I'm the older brother and I get the I get the girl, I get the thing, whatever else. Yeah, um, yeah. So it'd be, it'd be an interesting one, having, having Charlie as a big brother. I think it would be hard, like... Clearly, there's all this love, like, so much love between them, and it's a, you know, a real heart of the book is that relationship. But also, Charlie is hard to live up to. Yeah. Charlie gets everything first. You know, like, Charlie gets to go off to work and be a real man first. Yeah, yeah. And Charlie gets a girl first. And, you know, Charlie already knows his way around school. Yeah. Charlie is asked to go to war. Yeah. He gets everything first, yeah, yeah. and Tom is just left to follow. He doesn't have anything really of his own. That's an interesting point when they both start working at the farm, and Tom decides to go off basically on assignments without Charlie, that he wants a little bit of space from Charlie to do his own thing, and that actually when he first like thinks of enrolling, he wants to like sign up by himself and go off by himself to war and like you know make something of himself. And for him to be the mm. hero, and for not Charlie to be the hero. Always. It's a really interesting, like, narratorial position to take, isn't it? I guess it, for a story about war, having that as our protagonist who's taking us through it, like, first-person narrator as well, is because it, it's that kind of, like, naivety and innocence that you're being led into yeah. it behind someone else. Yeah. Like, it's, it's really clever, that, now I'm thinking about it, you know, because mm. this story would not be the same, it wouldn't be as effective. If we had this story from Charlie's perspective, Tom is always finding out about things second. And, you know, the world found out second what the First World War was going to be. And I think that kind of, that point in history where the war starts and people are talking about it and it's in the newspapers and stuff, but it's like, it's going on for about a year before it really starts to affect them. But yeah, it's like some yeah. some duke, some posh bloke's been shot and now Germany and France don't like each other, which means that we don't like Germany and uh, whatever. 
yeah, none of them knew what why they were really going. And like Charlie makes a really good point when Tom was like, "Oh, I'm going to go and prove myself. I'm going to join the army." Yeah, I'll shoot a rabbit because I can eat it. I'll shoot a rat because it carries infection. Yeah. Why would I shoot a German? He doesn't want to go to war. You know why would he? He's a lot like that as well. He's like, "Why would I?" That that's also that also sums yeah. him up. You tell him to do something, he's like, well... Well, that, cause that's his other thing, and that it gets him in bother, is, like, all the way through in school, and then once they're in the war as well, he's... You know, reading it this time was the first time I saw Charlie as at all kind of difficult or problematic. On all previous re-readings, I just wanted to be Charlie, because, like, this... His kind of... His attitude to authority, it was like, I've got so much time for that. Like, if it gets... If he gets told off, he'd, he'll just stare people down. He's got no respect at all for, like, hierarchies of authority or, like... Yeah. Once he's in the army, like, he'll backchat sergeants and if he doesn't agree with an order, he'll say so, which obviously gets him in a lot of bother, <laughs> like, you know. Well, and, like, it gets the rest of them in bother. Like, Tomo says... Charlie was prodding the wasp and it was stinging him and it was stinging us yeah. too. And yet at the same time, he's such a hero, right? Yeah. Like, I, I agree. Yeah, that everybody looks up to him and he, like, keeps everyone's spirits <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah, like, I think there's... Um, Gets everyone joking along, singing the, along. My favourite one, so when, when they're in training, they've got this, like, awful, awful sergeant called Hanley. And he's like, you're a horrible little worm, peaceful. What are you? Happy yeah, to be happy here, to sir. Be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then he asks again. I said, you are a little worm. What are you? I said, happy to be here. <laughs> um, it's the bit I'm thinking of particularly is uh, shortly before things all start to go wrong, they see, a, they see a plane for the first time. Oh, yeah. So they're all out together too. in the fields, uh, Tom O'Charlie and Molly. And there's... Uh, they see a plane over, and you know they they've heard about planes. They've seen pictures of planes in the paper. Like if you think we're in, you know, I guess it's before the war started, so we're in nineteen twelve or nineteen thirteen. Planes have not really long been a thing, um, and they yeah. see one overhead. They hear the engine coming and look up, and there's this bright yellow biplane, and they give it a wave, and then. You, comes and lands in the fields they're in and asks them for directions and gives them some sweets. Yeah, and doesn't stop the engine because it'll never it get, won't started get started again. again yeah. <laughs> and then that is just, I think it's, just, it's so clever because it's this absolute moment of joy, but is this oncoming yeah. of machinery. It's also foreshadowing. And, yeah. Yeah. No, it's such a joy. It's just such a pure, like, happy yeah. thing cool thing that happened to them and like the pilot gives them all humbugs and so they know yeah, it really yeah. happened because they've still got the humbugs <laughs> and then takes off and just clears the hedge <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have to throw themselves on their yeah, bellies it's, oh god it. yeah of course talking about <laughs> foreshadowing I've forgotten that bit blimey so yeah it's this really yeah. friendly pilot and then he takes off and like for a laugh turns round and like dive bombs them like guns yeah. straight like <laughs> go straight for them with the propeller and they have to all throw themselves on their bellies and then by the time they roll over and look up he's pulling away and he's cackling at them which is just like yeah. you know it's playful and stuff but that then you know mm. a few chapters later you've got whiz bangs and missiles coming in and and throwing yourself on your belly to survive yeah 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 but it's just oh man so, yeah, you know, we don't get to war till over halfway through, but then when we do, God, it packs it in. Eventually, they get sent into wipers, into Ypres. You've got your first kind of, like, full-scale, yeah. this-is-properly-scary yeah. battle. But then it's relentless. Yeah, it, it, well, that's then it. it just that's keeps the thing. going yeah. and going and going. And they're just sort of... I think they're described as each, like, each man huddled in his own private misery... Because they can't talk to yeah. each other, you know, they can't make light of it, they can't, you know, it's just, just relentless. We said we weren't going to talk about the graphic bit, so I think that's, that's as graphic, <laughs> that's as graphic that's as we'll get. That's, that's yeah. the line we'll go to. You know, it really, really puts you right in, right in the middle of it. And the, uh, the other thing for me as well with that, with the battles, what I thought was really interesting was... Like, they're very repetitive. 
Yeah. And yeah. it's so similar, but it's like, that is it, you know, that, and it's just that absolute pointlessness. Mm. Right, so the, you know. But but the men who are going back on leave are all acting like it is, right? Yeah. Because they can't bear to bring the horrors yeah, home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all like, oh, we have a jolly good time out there. It's all right. It's not so bad. Yeah. Be over soon. Yeah. And when Charlie does that, when Charlie goes home and um, Tomo gets a letter about that visit home and his mom says, oh, he says it's not so bad, but he's looking a bit thinner than I'd like him. Mm. Tom was really angry. No, his friend is because he reads the letter out to his friend. And Tomo reads it, and then Pete's like, "Oh, it's all fine over here, is it? Is that what he's? How's he got any right to say that? Yeah, like all those lads who died yesterday, are they having a fine old time? Yeah, because then when Charlie comes back, he won't tell Tomo anything about Molly and Mum and all the rest of it. No, it's like they stay there and yeah. we stay here, and it's separate. And I don't these want these are them two mixing. separate worlds. Yeah. And I'm not gonna if I talk about them, I'll bring yeah. them here, and if I talk about this over there, I'll bring it over there." Which is interesting that, again, if we're looking at Charlie's character as that sort of quite healthy but quite typical masculinity. Is it healthy? I would not say that's healthy. No, not that. Not that. But I think overall he's got quite a healthy masculinity. Not telling people about anything. Not ever letting yourself cry about anything. Yeah, that, that compartmentalisation again plays yeah. into that stereotype entirely. You're talking about the pacing. You want to talk about the tense? Yeah, that's another thing in the writing that's really interesting. So we start in the present tense. The chapter headings are times. And so we have our narrator, Tomo, sitting up through the night, wanting to remember yeah. everything. Yeah, and sort of writing this sort of Suppose, almost like diary yeah, style. And it flashes back. You know, it's this time, this is happening, and then he flashes back. And the first back. one of those flashbacks is to Charlie taking to school in its present tense. So we have, uh, well, let's, let's, let's read a bit. Yeah. We like it reading a bit, especially Michael Mulpergo, because yes. he's great. Charlie has taken me by the hand, leading me because he knows I don't want to go. I've never worn a collar before and it's choking me. My boots are strange and heavy on my feet. My heart is heavy too because I dread what I'm going to. Charlie has told me often how terrible this school place is about Mr Munnings and his raging tempers and the long whipping cane he hangs on the wall above his desk. But yeah, so we start kind of with that present tense and then it just sort of shifts and I think um, the first point I noticed it, so they get caught in a gas attack at one point and I was reading it going, oh, we're in present tense again. Um, and I think, I, I haven't yeah. checked back through, I think it makes that switch a few times and sometimes within sections it moves between Mm. past and present but it's done fairly yeah and it gives yeah, a sort of like yeah, immediacy it's, it's done fairly seamlessly but there are Isn't these it? like set point moments where it's like this is in the present tense this is happening right now um, mm. do you know that's quite oh, a it? French thing um, French novels are often written right. in the present tense and when and then when, when they're not it feels really stilted and like far away like the use of the past tense in French sounds both very formal and very far away mm. so when you're talking about something very animated or something that was recent you always tell a story in a book or even just like in common speech you'll say oh so I'm doing this and then this happens and then this happens you won't say so I was doing yeah. this you'll say this happens and then this happens Mr. Mokapurgo is quite a francophile and loves the French can definitely speak French, so I wonder if he's read mm -hmm. French books and like picked that technique up for like, you know, conveying immediacy mm -hmm. with the tenses. That might be a, like something Maybe, he's picked yeah, up from French yeah. books. Well, I think the the pacing of it through the night is really important mm -hmm. in maintaining mm -hmm. tension as well. That even though the story he's telling is spanning ten years, maybe like yeah. the point from which yeah, he's yeah. telling you it is just one night and you can feel every time he writes down a new time yeah. like the time is passing and that there's some yeah, immediacy yeah. to get this whole thing out to remember uh, yeah, everything. No, that's a really good point is that it's um it's not a memoir it doesn't have that feel of you maybe get a lot of war stories where it's like the framing is a character remembering back on their time in the war or something but this it's totally he's now like he's still out there um 
Yeah. I think that's yeah. really important, actually, is that there's no hindsight. None of these characters have the benefit mm. that we have of knowing what the First World War was or meant and how long it went on for or like... Um... No. Oh, we haven't talked about oranges and lemons. Got to talk about oranges and lemons. Here's our next talking okay. point. The, the use of music in this book is really important. So from the beginning, we have this motif of Joe, Big Joe, their brother, likes to sing oranges and lemons in a sort of like self-soothing way. You could say almost like echolalia way. He just like likes to sing to himself and that's a song he likes to sing to himself. And so it, from that, it becomes sort of their family song as well that they sing together. There, there are a few other songs referenced, which are hymns, but um, Big Joe doesn't like any of those as much. So they stick with oranges and lemons. And then when uh, Tomo and Charlie are out at the front, they also sing and hum oranges and lemons to remind themselves of home mm. and mum and Big Joe. Yeah, yeah. And I think he even says, so they, they get the horrible, they get horrible Hanley for training and then they get a nicer general, mm. and a nicer general massively approves of singing in the troops because it keeps morale He's up. lovely him. And Tomo goes, and it did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it did. It was really good. Yeah. Um, you know, and we finished this song, and then I started up with Oranges and Lemons, and Charlie joined in, and then soon the whole company is, like, stomping along to Oranges and yeah. Lemons. and everyone's laughing. <laughs> Big Joe is such a great character, and he, like, Oranges and Lemons and Big Joe yeah. go together. So, yeah. like way through yeah. like i think when um like when tomo sees the sort of recruitment band marching through town for the first time and they're all singing long way to tipperary and all this and they've all got their scarlet yeah. uniforms on and he's saying i mind <laughs> good job big joe wasn't here or else he'd be joining in with oranges and lemons at the top <laughs> of his voice <laughs> yeah like big joe is such a joyful mm -hmm. character yeah Joe will, he loves animals. He's got a little menagerie yeah. he keeps down in the shed. He's got like a hedgehog and a slow worm and like he looks yeah. after stuff so attentively and he could never think of yeah. harm in anything. And then it ties into religion as well, doesn't it? Because Joe firmly believes... Joe believes in heaven. ...that, that, that dad's up yeah. in heaven and that Bertha's up in yeah. heaven, his dog... And, I mean, that made me a bit uncomfortable, actually, like how the mother keeps sort of forcing this idea of heaven on Joe mm. as a way to, like, I guess, like, stem his grief. Yeah. It, like, it feels like Tomo has a choice about being religious, mm -hmm. and in the end he sort of falls out of it, whereas whenever anything bad happens, whenever anybody or anything dies... Like, the mum jumps in straight away with, yes, Joe, they're in heaven now. Yeah. Up there in heaven. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it feels almost a little bit patronising yeah. to him, actually, to do that to him. Yeah, I can see that, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's unrealistic. I think absolutely people treat disabled people that way all the time. Yeah, particularly um, at that time, I think, you know, we've got, like, yeah, probably a depiction yeah. of a unusually good treatment of a of a disabled person yeah actually yeah which you know isn't to say that you know there's not room for improvement but again i guess as similarly to what we're saying with charlie's masculinity not necessarily being healthy but yeah. probably within that framework of the time it's about as good as you're going to get yeah pretty good and it's believable yeah. you know it's yeah. really believably written at from mm. that time i guess who is it for so what does Michael Mulpergo say about who is it for? Well, I, I've not got the exact quote. <laughs> I was reading an interview and where he was, he, he basically said, like, this isn't a kid's book. This is a book for everyone. And he seemed to be making the point that, like, I'm a children's author, so people assume this is a children's book, but it's it's really a book for everyone. I think it has it has that accessibility of language. It's very It's very matter of fact. It's not a difficult book to read intellectually. Well, but emotionally, emotionally it really yeah. is. Um, one thing I was going to say on that, actually, like, because I remember when I first read it, my mum had read it before me, and that was actually really useful. Mm -hmm. And not as a kind of, not in a mollycoddling way, 
Um, but just in the, I think she introduced the book to her. She read it and was like, oh, Matt, you'll love this. It's really right. sad. Um, I don't know. I would, maybe I was already a history nerd by that point. Um, mm. But having someone who'd read it, who was like an adult in my life, who I could talk to about it afterwards... Yeah. Um, was really useful and that's why I don't really mind that it's studied in schools generally I'm like don't study books in schools puts kids off but like this one really bears a together experience yeah and I think it's good um, enough to survive discussion. That, you know yeah um but I agree I think it's lovely that it's being done in schools and I think it's a really good antidote to like all the pomp and like pro-british legion of like early November in the UK, you know, all the lest we forget and the pro-militaristic remembrance ceremonies, yeah. you know. It's really, it's a really good discussion of the world, that First World War, that doesn't at all justify the atrocities, you know. And I think that is the right, I, I, I don't think there's anything glorious about, you know, our warlike past. It doesn't preach. It's not preachy at all. Um, no. And all the better for it. So I think, yeah, I think probably probably wouldn't go much younger than 10, as you say. For all the children. Is it a read aloud? Uh, I've never read it aloud. I don't think it is, you know. It's a bit more of a private experience. Yeah, it's a curl up on your own and then come back and talk about it, yeah. I think. Don't read it to your kid at bedtime expecting a happy ending. No, there's, yeah. I think there's real virtue in a happy ending. I think happy endings are good. This is not that. No, it is at best an ambiguous ending. You were talking about the remembrance thing and I think uh, reading some of the stuff Morpurgo said, being asked about remembrance, he was saying... Um, I think what remembrance is for is to make sense of what happened so that you can maybe understand the possibilities of the future better. That's the way I rationalised it anyway. Which I think can take us nicely yeah. on to our second book, The General. The General. Um, so this one's new to us, but it's from 1961. And it was interesting to me because it's written by... Um, Janet Charters and illustrated by Michael Foreman, both of whom were born in 1938. So both kind of Second World War babies, children who lived through the Second World War. Mm. Um, and then they both went to art school and met each other there. And that's how they ended up collaborating on this. It's both of their first book. Do you want to tell the story? Because I did the first one. Yeah, I can tell the story. There's a, a general who's uh, not unlike the sort of nasty general figure in Horrible handling. Private Peaceful. <laughs> so we've got this general who uh, wants to be the most well-known and successful general in the world, so he makes sure that all of his soldiers are inspected regularly in parade all the time and have their badges and guns polished and shiny and that they're all in order and all go off to rifle practice and know what they're doing and are all split into rows and sections and regimented and ordered. And, and he likes to stay up late reading about great generals and battles of the past and longing, hoping, waiting for the day when him and his army are famous enough to be written about in a book. Uh, and then one day he's riding off on his horse somewhere and he gets thrown off his horse and he lands in the grass. He doesn't hurt himself because the grass is soft. Um, and he just lies there for a bit. And he takes a bit of grass and puts it in his mouth and chews it. <laughs> and thinks, oh, it's quite nice just lying down here. And then he gets up and he realises that there are flowers everywhere. And that he's trampled a couple of them, which makes him sad. And he's he decides eventually, oh, I best get back to camp. And he walks home and he notices things that he's never noticed before because he's always been powering through on a horse and so he sees all the wildlife he sees the badgers and the peacocks and, and the bees and the bees yeah um which is another link to private peaceful yeah yeah do you want to do you want to tell us about um so there's a moment in private peaceful where tomo is doing a um, war game an exercise in his training 
and you know it's all like running around like stabbing their bayonets into straw men and like throwing themselves on their tummies in the grass to like hide from the bombs or whatever mm. so he's on his tummy in the grass and there's a little bumblebee in front of him and it's just you know doing its job getting the nectar out of the flowers and Tomo says to him we are much alike bee you and me you may carry your pack underneath you and your rifle may stick out of your bottom but you and me be are much alike and then the general in this book has a very similar moment with the bees and the flowers he's sitting in the flowers and the bees are all around him and he's like surely one of these bees is going to sting me on the nose but they're far too busy they're just doing their job and they pollinate and they go away mm. and he goes off on his walk Mm-mm. yeah I'd, I'd miss that it's an interesting moment actually that he assumes that because they've got a weapon they're going to use it yeah yeah so he yeah so he gets back to camp having had his lovely day being a hippie general hanging about in the flowers and there <laughs> he has a dream that night of soldiers trampling over all of the flowers and he's screaming stop stop and he wakes up and thinks about how many flowers his army must have trampled in real life and so he goes to his army the next day and he says right what i want you all to do is go home and go to your families and go to your jobs and 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 do nice things and make your country as peaceful and colorful and as beautiful as you possibly can go on off you go we're not we're not go being and an farm army the anymore. Land. go and yeah. farm the land go and and he says, I don't want a military camp here anymore. I want a city with shops and schools and parks for the children to play in. Which, again, is very 60s, isn't it? That very rebuilding the country. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily <laughs> jump to a city now as a, a vision of peace, but I think it was that kind of mm. utopian rebuilding project. So, yes, they all, it set, dismisses them all, sends them all off. And, and it, well, it doesn't dismiss them because he goes and inspects them and they're all really happy when he shows up and... Tells him, well done, that's, that's looking great. Then he invites generals from around the world who have heard about this project of his. So he goes to show them all of the colourful flowers, eventually leads them back to the field that he first had his kind of epiphany in. And uh, they sit down being very careful not to crush the flowers and declare that he is the most famous general in the whole world. And then <laughs> the most famous general in the whole world lies down for a nice little nap in the grass. Um, and <laughs> that's, that's where we leave him. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a little utopia. It's a little utopia. It's and it, a little 60s utopia. I've not really thought about how 60s it is. It makes so much sense that it's an early 60s book. Because um, yeah. it's it, it's quite literally flower power, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and f I, I mean, I suppose we're at crossing eras now. This is not sixties, but he also reminded me once he'd had his uh, had his epiphany of uh, sort of a Walt Whitman figure. <laughs> was, yeah. You know, just <laughs> that kind of fervent defence and celebration of doing nothing or doing nice things or you know yeah. um like <laughs> that that being worthy of defending more so than guns yeah. and national borders are although i suppose we you know we still have an idea of nationalism here we still have it still make your country great for sure nation states um, and but it's generals being in charge yeah and uh i yeah. guess it's you know it's if the, if this was book if this book was written now it would be interesting because I think it'd be quite different because I think that idea of mm -hmm. you know as I said like building cities as a utopian thing probably isn't the thing anymore but even stuff like farming guessing like yeah. increase now of like vegan culture and like awareness of agriculture impact and climate change I think that idea of go and work the land would probably have yeah, shifted by now as well. Now. Um, but it's very much, I don't think it's dated, but it's very much of its time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it feels like a very pre-Cold War book to me as well. Like, they haven't had that yet. They've just come out of the Second World War. They're the babies of the Second World War. And they're like, let's never do that again. Let's build a beautiful world. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? And I, I really like the optimism of that. 
Yeah. And I was looking at, so the reason that we picked this one is because Michael Foreman, like Michael Morpurgo, has written a lot about World War II, has written like an autobiography, basically, of his boyhood called War Boy. Mm. He's also written very like ecologically minded books, like dinosaurs and all that rubbish about how like cars rubbish up the planet and he wishes the dinosaurs could just come and stomp them all. <laughs> And I, I read this amazing story about him when he was a child. His first ever memory is of being three and a bomb coming through the ceiling and just missing him. Wow. He was in bed. So he's born in 1938, um, a month after his father died. So his mum was a single mum. Oh, my God. And she God. was bringing him and his two older brothers up. And she ran the shop across the road. So she had put him to bed in her bedroom. And then she'd like gone back across the road to work in the shop. And his brothers were supposed to be watching him. And so he was asleep. The bomb comes in like right above his bed, but at an angle. So it just misses him. Hmm. Bounces on the floor into the fireplace and then explodes. And very luckily explodes in the fireplace because it's an incendiary bomb. And so the fire all goes up the chimney and his brothers ran in and managed to put out the fire before the whole building went up. And then his mum ran in from the shop, scooped him up, and they went and hid in the dugout outside the fish and chip shop. And that's his very first memory. Oh, my God. You know, talk about making a pacifist. It gives me shivers, stories like that, because I just... Do you know what it is? You know St Nick's Cathedral in Newcastle? Yeah. I think it was when they had, like, a Heritage Open Day, and I went for a walk around there, and they've got... Mm -hmm. um, They've got a stained glass window from the 60s. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, oh, yeah, it was a, it's a replacement of the original that got blown out by a bomb that landed down on the quayside. But, like, for people not from Newcastle, we're talking four, five hundred yards down a steep hill. Yeah. And so it was just that image of, like, Jesus, so a bomb that's landed down there has blown this window out up here. Yeah. It's so far away from any of my reference points. Imagine being bombed. So it, it just, I don't know, it always shocks yeah. us that it's something that's happened here in living yeah. memory. And then, of course, stuff like that yeah. is happening, you know, in other parts of the world. Currently. Pretty much constantly, yeah. right? Like, Yeah, yeah. But so this feels to me like a book that like very much comes out of these experiences of being young during the war and like a, you know, let's make something better. Mm. And I think that hasn't aged that badly, really. I mean, yeah, it does feel very 60s and flower power. The you references, know, and the idea all, but the, the sentiment hasn't dated. The sentiment is still really good, I think. I think it's very interesting that the general is called General Jodper because... Mm. Jodhpur is a word we've taken from India through colonialism. Mm, mm. Jodhpurs are these like army trousers basically that are like tight on the calf and baggy. Yeah, it's what, what you wear for thighs. horse riding, so, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were what people in the town of Jodhpur wore to do sports. Oh, and then right. like, basically we nicked that and called those Jodhpurs. It's not what people from Jodhpur called them. But, you know, like, even that feels like a little subtle dig at colonialism, at British colonialism. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. I really like seeing Michael Foreman's early work as well. Like, I want to talk about the artwork a bit. Like, it's very colourful and, like, playful. And silly. Yeah. I, I loved the faces of when he goes and tells the army that they're dismissed and like to go home and make nice things. They're like, they're smiles. Yeah. And then the, the world that he builds with these like gorgeous fields and this gorgeous city, really so colourful and beautiful, isn't it? Like, mm. and his, his art style's a bit different now. It's a little bit more realistic, mm. Mm. a bit less fantastical um he still draws a really good horse mm. then and now yeah um <laughs> i quite like as well you've kind of got different textures in there because you've got that sort of almost mm -hmm. childlike drawing but then like 
the animals, like the badger and the peacock and stuff, they're sort of, it feels almost like they're almost collaged on. They're sort of superimposed, mm. it's like much more sort of detailed. Well, he went to fine art school, so, you know, he can do that. Yeah. When he's not doing that, it's a choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to talk about nature, about another link to Private Peaceful, in that, you know, the place where Tom was really happy was nature, when he's out poaching with mm. his brother. Mm. And they're down by the river and they're with the animals and they've got this very strong connection to animals. And then this is similar. It's like they're almost, it's almost religious, right? Like mm. this idea of the sacred and that we have been desecrating this all this time and it yeah. needs to be protected. I know I was saying about the idea of going off and farming would maybe be updated now. That reminded us of a, a moment in Private Peaceful as well that had really stuck out to us when Charlie comes back to the front having been on leave and he's sort of saying how things are back home. And I just remember one of the things you were saying is like, there's no, there's no young men left anymore um, and all the fields have just been left to go fallow. Yeah. And just that image of like, like just everything grinding to a halt. So mm. this felt like a really nice counterpoint to that. Uh, you know, picking yeah. up, picking up that idea, I suppose, of like what what are we all doing here, parading around. Like there are, you know, there are things yeah. to be done, but there is there is food to grow. There are, yeah, there's art to yeah. make. There's fish to fish, which is you know to run slightly counter <laughs> to the <laughs> no harming of animals thing. Like fishing is still cool. Well, and the farming and hunting and fishing are also parts of being with the land and taking care of the land. Yeah. Like this idea of nature as untouched is also a very white supremacist idea that, like, we can't exist together. That either it's untouched and pure, or we ransack the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe there's a middle ground. See again, people, binaries are the problem. The spread is quite interesting. The fact that you get generals in from other places is that like international <laughs> socialism. It's so funny that they're also generals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one thing that this book doesn't disrupt. But I also think that's part of the joke of the book. Yeah. Like, yeah, it is yeah. a funny book. Yeah. You know, that he still gets to be the most famous general in the world. They don't say you're the most famous ecologist. No. No. Or urbanist. They say you're the most famous general in the world. Which is what he wants right at the beginning. He wants a book to be written about him as the most famous general in the world. And here it is. It is written. It's called The General. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I, I wasn't able to find very much out about the writer, Janet Charters. But I want to talk about the clarity of her writing. It's very clear. It's very, even quite spare. Mm. But like witty as well like like when she says about um the bees not bothering to sting him even though he is a very important general yeah yeah like, yeah <laughs> it's witty without making direct jokes yeah it's funny and but it's not like punny or jokey yeah but it's not dry either it's just sort no. of like bubbling away in the background just this yeah gentle yeah gentle humorousness i appreciated the writing of it a lot um, yeah, totally. It's just sort of light and bright and funny. Yeah. How how young would you go with this book? Probably like five. I'd go four or five, yeah. It is fairly long for a picture book, so you you want a bit of an attention span. It's really nice. It's really pretty as well. Like, I think it's one that a child might just want to leaf through without you reading it to them. Yeah just to look at it and look yeah. at all the little details in the pictures. They're very detailed. There's a lot going on, especially in the later part of the book where you're looking at the world that's been built by what used to be the army. Nice little nice little slice of reminder from the 60s that it's, it's okay to mm. be hopeful. <laughs> it's always possible to make a big change. And it's as easy as falling off a horse. So that was episode 10 of Even the Trunchbull. Thanks for listening. Once again, if you've any thoughts on books you loved as a kid... Or love now as a kid. Let us know, or ask a grown-up to let us know. We're at eventheshrunchbull at gmail.com, or catch us on Twitter at trunchbullpod. Or on Facebook at trunchbullpod now as well. Intro music for this episode and every episode is What a Wonderful Day by Shane Ivers. And remember, kids' books can be for everyone, because we've all been kids. 
even the trunch book. book.